which helps smallholder farmers realize the promise of that technology, thinking about basically research on how you would do scaling. And finally, we have research on sustainable intensification. How can you pull all the different research, research streams together in the field in a way that sustainably transforms production systems? And, and Jerry will be talking about that in a little bit. So with, um, with Administrator Shaw's request to us, to our Bureau, that we really prioritize scaling technologies, we've been working about thinking about how we can link our centrally funded research programs and those research outputs to our USAID missions in the field. Uh, the, many, many Feed the Future activities, the development programs, of course, take place in the field. And what we'd like to do is ensure that the research outputs are feeding into those efforts and through those development programs are reaching many more farmers. So we're working with our missions to develop scaling plans. We're identifying constraints, setting targets for how we're going to scale up promising technologies and practices and what are the right combinations of technologies and practices to get out the door. Uh, these plans are taking into account the important role of women, thinking about sustainable commercial pathways with the private sector where possible, thinking about how to help the systems adapt to climate change, taking into account our objectives around nutrition, system resilience, looking at the policy environment. So as you might imagine, these scaling plans have to take a fairly comprehensive view of the country and the situation in the country, thinking about how we can best scale those promising technologies. Another interesting development is that at the end of June, we announced, along with the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, a new partnership, the Scaling Seeds and Technologies Partnership, a 47 million three-year partnership, which is intended to accelerate smallholder farmer access to transformative agriculture technologies. It's going to be working in four countries within the G8's new alliance for food security, Ethiopia, Ghana, Mozambique, and Tanzania. And it will be helping governments to strengthen their seed sectors and promoting the commercialization, the distribution, and the adoption of promising seeds and other key technologies. They've set some ambitious targets for this program, increase the production of high quality seeds by 45% in three years, and they're ensuring that 40% more farmers gain access to innovative agriculture technologies. So we're, we see this as a great opportunity to leverage technology's transformative potential, and we're looking forward to really taking innovation to scale in, in, in line with the CATA process that's underway in Africa. And then, of course, we're looking at events like today and others like this as a way of stimulating discussion and getting feedback from you all, the workers in the community, as to how we can best achieve this agenda. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speakers today. I'm going to introduce them briefly at the front, and then they will go ahead and, and do their presentations. The first speaker will be Dr. Jerry Glover from the Bureau for Food Security here at USAID. He has a great title. He's the Senior Sustainable Agricultural Systems Advisor. He's also a National Geographic Explorer. He has a PhD in soil science. He's an expert in perennial and integrated agricultural systems. And his work has been highlighted by Scientific American as one of the top 10 world changing ideas. So we're truly fortunate to have him on our staff. He will be speaking today about systems research and developing linkages for scaling this research in a heterogeneous environment. Our next speaker will be Bob Nanis of IDE. He is the Vice President for Technology and Innovation, working in agriculture and irrigation development for over 30 years. He has run two private businesses. And at IDE, he's run more than 50 projects as a country director. And he has been contributing to IDE's core agricultural methodology. He will be talking to us today about the relationship between research and dissemination, particularly in the private sector for supply and service. Our last speaker, and this is how we can take advantage of fantastic technology, our last speaker will actually be joining us from Nairobi. He's uh, Steve New of FinTrack. He has a PhD in post-harvest physiology and three decades of agricultural development experience across four continents. He's managed USAID projects, he's led donor evaluation teams, and he's advised government ministries and producer associations in agriculture. He will be speaking to us today about addressing constraints to scaling and commercialization including the key issue of financing. So I look forward to the talks, and we'll be, as Julie said, we'll have time for questions at the very end. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, very pleased to be here this morning talking about some of our central programs at USAID in terms of uh, the Feed the Future Initiatives research strategy. So I'm be talking about our, one of our central concepts that informs our efforts, sustainable intensification. It's a concept that's uh, gained a lot of prominence in recent years. It's kind of the coming together of, of the 
environmental uh, folks from the 80s and, and the Green Revolution folks on the agricultural side. So it's really now a consensus about the need for increased agricultural productivity, but with a, a tremendous emphasis on decreasing the negative impacts on the environment and with much greater emphasis on uh, the so social and economic conditions of the farmer. Just uh, kind of briefly on the concept, this comes from a recent panel report uh, on sustainable intensification and some of the general concepts. But, but mainly, uh, we can look at ecological, genetic, and socioeconomic intensification. In other words, getting more from the sunlight, getting more from water resources, using improved seed, improved cultivars, uh, better fertilizer management, better tillage management, and so on. That way we can get more yield per unit land area. But of course we have to consider this environmental sustainability as well. Decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, maintaining long-term soil health, and so on. So it, it's, a, it's a, a big challenge as we try to meet uh, these dueling needs of increased food production and uh, a better environment. So that forms really a central concept around which we're, we're uh, developing our research programs. Two of our major sustainable intensification programs uh, our CESA, the Serial Systems Initiative of South Asia, and Africa Rising. The Rising stands for Research in Sustainable Intensification for the Next Generation, and it's focused in, in uh, Africa. Uh, the CESA program has done a tremendous job on scaling out some of these soil conservation technologies, uh, getting better seeds and management practices for those rice wheat systems in uh, South Asia. Now, of course, Asia has gone a long way toward intensification as a result of the Green Revolution with some environmental uh, problems, with some social problems. And so now really CESA uh, combining some of the better agronomic practices with considerations of those social and, and environmental issues. So they're, they're, you know, they, they are a, a step ahead of us in some respects in Africa where increased total productivity has, uh, has been driven a lot by extensification. In other words, opening up more land area rather than, as in Asia, increasing the yield per unit land area. So in, in Africa, we face uh, s several challenging conditions that are, um, in general, different than those that we face, face in South Asia. And I'm going to be focusing primarily on our Africa Sustainable Intensification Program. Uh, because I think it'll set a context for the later discussion about scaling technologies. Um, so when we think about scaling technologies, we're often thinking about specific, uh, a specific crop cultivar, uh, maybe increasing access to fertilizer, maybe just scaling up the use of a specific tillage uh, Im implement. But in uh, what we see in Africa is we, we have these very patchy conditions. So here we have uh, different fields, different distances away from a household with, with very distinct uh, soil fertility gradients. The further away you get, often we get these very poor soils uh, where nutrients have essentially been mined for long periods of time. And maybe richer soils closer to the household where more nutrients have been recycled onto those. Now, this isn't just uh, on a single farm necessarily. But this could represent the soil fertility gradients we see with different uh, economic levels of farmers. So maybe a, a wealthier farmer uh, has been able to invest more in her land, and she's, she's, uh, she has a bit more soil fertility. With our research efforts, we're primarily focused on these small, poorer smallholder farmers operating on these uh, more marginal, degraded soils. And in fact, uh, most of the farmers with whom we're working in Africa Rising are really down here on these uh, highly degraded. So they're inherently poor, but then through many years of farming, they've been degraded further. So uh, we have this issue of simultaneously needing to rehabilitate the soils while also increasing yield, which presents some issues with scaling whenever, you know, in other words, 
an appropriate intervention on this site might be very different than the appropriate intervention on this site. So we have to really target the interventions and understand what the farmer's needs are and what their agroecological requirements are. That's the patchiness issue. And, and that's led to uh, what some people have described as non-responsive soils. I was just up in northern Ghana in the Upper East region last week, and we ran into this uh, in several communities where people were saying, our soils are so degraded, we apply expensive fertilizers, our crops uh, don't respond. There could be several reasons for that. One, they're maybe not using improved cultivars. Uh, but two, maybe the soils are just so low in organic matter that the use and, and uh, efficient use, effective use of those fertilizers is very limited. Soils don't hold water and so on. Anyway, farmers are very reluctant, of course, to invest in expensive fertilizers if their crops simply aren't responding. So that gives us an indication that it can't be a single intervention, that we have to think about multiple components here when we think about increasing the yield per unit land area. And that's not just, uh, you know, there, it's difficult to invest labor, fertilizer, seeds in these soils uh, unless you take care of those multiple issues. This is just a, a graph um, from those uh, folks on that, 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 from this report, where they show what they're talking about. Um, oftentimes on research stations where these new cultivars are tested or fertilizers are tested, you get nice response um, results. Add the fertilizer, your yields go up. But this is what we see oftentimes in these small uh, holder farming systems on the poor soils. <clears throat> the other issue is, is uh, farm diversity. This is just a, a diagram of nutrient uh, cycles within the farm. Uh, so we have different quality of lands. These are the poor, poor fields, lighter in color. We have different crops. We have you know, higher productivity soils. Farmers, nearly all the farmers we work with uh, have livestock, very important part of their system. So that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, tree crops are an important component as well. So when we're looking at increasing the total productivity of the of the farm itself, we, we, we do try to look at multiple components. And of course, that brings into the issue, well, then which technology are we trying to scale? If we scale a technology that improves the yield of maize, for example, in Malawi, that might not substantially improve the economic conditions of the farmer. We need to look at the whole system itself, which then we get the question, well, how do you scale such a complex issue thinking about the patchiness, thinking about the, uh, the poor soils, and so on. So I just want to give one brief example from Malawi. Uh, I can't say that it's a success yet, because this is just the second year of Africa Rising. But I'll, show you, I'll lay out the system and then the plan that we have for scaling a system uh, focused around a specific technology. So the, the, the system, and this is just one system that we're looking at in Malawi, under Africa Rising, uh, but it's the doubled up legume system. It was developed by uh, University of Malawi researchers and folks at Michigan State University, and it's been extensively trialed, tested, and adapted uh, in parts of uh, northern Malawi. We're now working in, in uh, uh, regions around Lilongwe near the Zambia border with this. But essentially, the first year, uh, this is what's called the doubled up legume part. Growing intercropping pigeon peas with soybeans or groundnuts in the same year. This is an interesting system because these soy and groundnuts are very fast growing. They're short duration crops. You can get some yields right away. Complementing that is the pigeon pea. It's a much slower growing crop. It's longer lived. And so while the soya is growing very quickly, the pigeon peas kind of growing slow, not competing with resources but still fixing nitrogen. It is a legume, and it fixes an, uh, a large amount of, of nitrogen. In the second year, so the first year you get a, a harvest of soy or groundnut and a harvest of pigeon pea. The second year, 
The maize is planted into the regrowing pigeon pea. It's a short-lived perennial. Um, and you get a maize yield and a pigeon pea harvest. And it's been uh, widely tested and shown to be very nice in terms of providing multiple benefits to the farmer. Uh, it's, uh, they, they've gotten equal yields, with half, uh, equal yields of maize with half the fertilizer rate and twice, uh, roughly twice the amount of overall protein in the system. So you get, in two years, you get three harvests of legumes, one harvest of maize. And you can carry that out to a third year of just uh, monocropped maize to take full advantage of the extra nitrogen provided by the pigeon pea. Um, so again, that there's, this system is really addressing multiple issues. Restoration of soil health, improved nutrition, uh, increased or high yields of, of maize with lower inputs. So you get that full complex of sustainable intensification in a fairly simple system. Uh, you can also address some of the livestock issues because it produces excellent fodder for livestock as well as the grain. It's been tested in terms of uh, impacts on household nutrition. So it, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good example of what we're talking about when we're talking about a system of sustainable intensification. So how do you scale this? Well, you know, the key component here really uh, is pigeon peas. We have access to some good cultivars of soybean, good cultivars of, of groundnut. There's still issues in the seed systems with that in those areas. But, but uh, we can still get access. Maize, we, get, we can get good access to some maize hybrids um, and so on. Pigeon pea is a real, real issue here, though. New cultivars have recently been released by ICRASAT, not widely available. So what are we going to do if we want this system to be successful? You have to a have access not only to the seeds, but the, uh, the information on how to grow it in this system and information on how to process it so that it's actually usable, marketable, and, and uh, has positive impacts on nutrition. Here's the system in a, in a picture that I think shows you a little bit better. In the understory, here's the groundnut ready for harvest. And you'll see the pigeon pea is just now flowering. So there's really not much competition for resources at that point. Uh, then, of course, after the harvest of the pigeon peas, uh, they'll go in and plant maize for the next season. And the pigeon pea regrows. And, and so that's, this just shows you that system uh, a bit better. Uh, the, the roots actually, um, you know, are able to penetrate a bit deeper, so it's growing in the dry season on residual soil moisture. That's an important point because keeping continuous living cover on the soil is an important aspect of this. And in this system, we have uh, living plant cover uh, throughout the full two-year period. So that's a, a cornerstone of that conservation agriculture concept that's one of our sort of entry points for sustainable intensification. So in terms of how Africa Rising is, is, is working to scale up this system, and again, it's just one system of several we're looking at, we don't want to divert a lot of our research monies toward uh, development activities that are covered by the mission or other development projects. So we've tried to focus our resources primarily on the agricultural research and the seed issues and so on, but linking closely with USAID Malawi's flagship Feed the Future initiative project, the integrating nutrition in the value chain. And so you can see the interesting uh, complementarity of this agricultural system with a nutrition-focused program, increasing the legumes, but we're they're interested in in the increased um, value of the of the legumes, whereas agronomically we're incre we're more interested in the ability to increase yields. Now there's very strong linkages between that USAID Malawi project and the public sector. Uh, these extension program areas, there are quite a few across the country. It's a way for the government to get information on agricultural practices, uh, processing, nutrition. Uh, directly into the farm households. So that's a direct uh, connection to the farms across much of Malawi. Uh, we can work through health clinics uh, in this program. 
Uh, I put school lunch programs. I don't know that USAID Malawi is doing this, but just across the border in Zambia to promote biofortified maize, they're working directly with school lunch programs to get it directly into schools. The children then take that understanding home, and that's a great uh, scaling up. So um, the private sector, in a research program, we're often encouraged to connect with the private sector. That's a lot easier said than done. It's one of our big challenges. Because at the research stage, the private sector isn't necessarily very interested. They'll come to our meetings and, and think, great, but you know we're trying to get something right now out. So I think we found that staying in contact with them through these major development pro programs that give them a lot more opportunity for their commercial interests. Uh, that's better than trying to really force that relationship into the research itself. Uh, and through this, we can then reach thousands or tens of thousands of farmers with this one system uh, through the education materials uh, and the public sector investments. Anyway, that's kind of a very brief overview. I hope it kind of sets the, the context uh, for the, for the uh, subsequent talks. But I think it's important to keep in mind uh, in these challenging conditions, it's very difficult for farmers to invest in a expensive input when the results are often very unpredictable. Anyway, thank you very much. Sorry, I, had, I, I put one more additional slide on if I can get 30 more seconds. Uh, I, just, I did want to um, uh, offer this up as an additional opportunity for scaling this based on recent um, uh, recent projects that uh, PV and others here have, have worked on, really al trying to align different funding streams. So there are often uh, national government policies committed toward a green economy. We see this in several countries, reducing emissions, or uh, perhaps uh, you know sustainable landscapes in, in terms of decreasing deforestation. And of course, USAID puts money to different components as well. So Africa Rising is part of our food security investments, but we also have investments in sustainable landscapes focused on global climate change mitigation, and we have biodiversity funding. Often those go to different landscapes in the past. So we've piloted, we, we, no results yet, but we're hoping that in Malawi and Zambia we can align these to and focused on this uh, doubled up legume system and agroforestry practices that, that look very promising in terms of decreasing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and possibly providing fuel wood that decreases deforestation rates. There's another opportunity to work with the government on a much wider scale, get more investment in this, perhaps uh, convert some of their fertilizer subsidy programs over to uh, these more biologically based approaches. Anyway, that's just a sort of an add-on. Okay, thanks. That's it. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, there we are. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Nice to see uh, not everybody is on summer vacation yet. Um, so um, I'm going to talk today um, a little. Oh. So I come from an organization. Uh, for those of you who don't know anything about IDE, um, we're an international NGO that has focused on smallholder agriculture income generation, especially through off-season um, crop production. Uh, we focused a lot on small-scale irrigation um, and also uh, drinking water and sanitation, especially recently we've gotten quite involved in uh, marketing of uh, 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 latrines, a sanitation marketing program. So we, we are a dissemination organization and we are, although we're not a research organization, we have been involved in some research projects. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between research and dissemination. Um, I'm going to talk about a specific project that we were involved in, which was called the Ag Water Management Project, uh, funded by the Gates Foundation. And I'm going to talk about what 
for the outputs of that project and then what we're doing with those outputs. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see as some principles governing dissemination and how that's related to, to research. And maybe a little provocative at the end if I still have time to talk about what, what is scale? What is this scale thing that everybody's talking about? Okay, so the first thing, and this is not rocket science, but I think the key, the key word in this, uh, in this sentence is the word quality. So of course every researcher is going out and interviewing farmers or whatever. But uh, IDE has uh, recently, or in the last few years, gotten involved in something called human-centered design. And in that, you, you have to have a very substantive interaction with the farmers from the very beginning. And substantive is not just going out and doing an interview. It's spending a week in a community and understanding what are the triggers that drive uh, purchasing uh, uh, decisions and what are the and, and getting beyond what we call the scripts. So you go to a farmer and you and you and you interview them and you always get the same answer. Yes, I want that or yes, 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 yes. Everything is yes. But there are there are things going on behind that and there are ways to get beyond that. So those substantive interactions with farmers from the very beginning in the design of the research and also in the in the implementation and dissemination. Um, and not always thinking that you have to come up with new technologies. If when, when I look at this, when I show you this other research project, it was really more surveying what's out there and what works rather than trying to come up with something new. Um, and of course, a lot of researchers want to come up with something new because then they publish and they become the, the designer of something new. But there's, it's, it's a lot easier to find something that works over here and maybe try it over there. Um, and again, in this human-centered design process, it's, there should be a lot of back and forth. So, I, so for instance, uh, in some of the things that Jerry has talked about, you know, trying it on a small scale, actually doing test marketing to see if someone's willing to buy uh, what, what we have to offer, and then going back to, the, back to the drawing board and saying, OK, what did we learn from that? So prototyping, test marketing. Um, and also linking up dissemination, disseminators with researchers from the very beginning. And you'll see in the example that I give that that was the case. So that it's not just researchers working alone and then handing off, but disseminators having an input from the beginning. So this, is, this was the Ag Water Solutions Project. It was funded by the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And these are the partners. So you'll see these first three, I guess I have. These first three are all research institutions, EMI, IFPRI, and the Stockholm Environment Institute. And FAO and IDE are, you can say, more or less dissemination organizations. And the CH2M Hill is a, a kind of project management um, organization. So, it's, it, so it was looking at water issues, uh, primarily in Africa, although in Asia also, um, but with this kind of multidisciplinary look at, at, at things. Oops, sorry. So what came out of that project? Um, they surveyed a lot. They spent a lot of time in the field in West Africa, in uh, East Africa, in South Asia. And they came out with three technologies that they felt showed the most promise in the area of water, um, and especially uh, smallholder irrigation. So one of those is the small motorized pump, which in South Asia is ubiquitous at this point, but in Africa is really just coming on. Um, and also the prices are coming down. Um, rainwater harvesting, um, that has many different ramifications. There's different ways to harvest rainwater. And then tapping groundwater. And you can see here is one <laughs> very inexpensive way that was transferred from South Asia into, um, into Africa to actually drill, hand drilling of, of, uh, of tube wells, which is about 1 20th of the cost of getting a rig out there and doing the same thing. So these things were, after extensive research, were, uh, um, were seen to be promising technologies. And so what are, what, so I'm going to give you examples now, and then I'll, and I'll talk about how we would take this research and put this into use, or how we are doing that. Okay, so motorized pumping. 
right now in West Africa, where I was just living for four years, um, I was also living in Ghana, so I can, uh, Jerry just came back from there. Um, you can get a pump, something like that, uh, for about $150, okay? Um, that is potentially revolutionary for a lot of small farmers. Of course, we have to uh, be very aware of the environmental implications of that, and, there, and, and EMI did a lot of studies related to how much actual water there is available so we don't go out and pump all the water out of the aquifer, um, and so there's no drinking water left. Um, but there is a lot of potential in Africa for this. Um, so how would we go about disseminating this technology? First of all, it's already being disseminated. But how do we make it go faster? And how do we help it reach poorer farmers? Okay. So the first step, of course, is to learn about what this thing is, to understand what makes a pump a good one and what makes a pump a bad one. And so that's the technical uh, knowledge of uh, the relationship between the pump and the engine. I won't go into all the technical <laughs> details, but it's learning about that. And then it's setting a set of criteria in which we can actually out field people, either the, the government's field people or our field people or some other NGO or agency that we're working with, so that they can make recommendations about this is good and this is not good. And this is what to look for and this is what not to look for. Okay? And then um, and this is where IDEs, uh, and the other thing I didn't mention is, I mean, back to the early 80s, IDE has been involved in setting up private sector supply chains to deliver goods to farmers, in helping to facilitate those private sector supply chains. So this is where we start to create partnerships with private sector supply actors. In this case, it would be helping to facilitate a chain of importers, wholesalers, and retailers so that... Pro so at the same time, the next step, well, OK. So all of this has to be done at the same time. OK? So you're creating demand. You're creating a supply chain to, to, to fulfill that demand. And you're also creating a service sector that, w that can service the, the technologies. Okay, and this is particular for this type of thing, but I mean, the same kind of principles, I think, even can be applied to seeds or fertilizer or, or any other type of, of intervention. So it's about uh, looking at a market system where you're stimulating demand and where, at the same time, you're building up a private sector profitable supply chain. Okay. Now, manual well drilling is a little bit different. I put this picture in here. I don't know if you can see it very well, because this is the alternative to manual well drilling. There's a guy down in that hole there dig, digging a well. This is in Ghana, in northern Ghana, actually. Um, but there are, there, 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 is, there are ways to very easily, from the surface, hand drill. In, in, uh, in India or Bangladesh, it costs like $10 to drill a 30-foot deep well. Um, so, but of course, it's more expensive in Africa. But um, but it's a it's a it's a technology that should be disseminated. It's not applicable in every place. So so the first thing you have to do is understand. And and Jerry rightly brought up that there's a lot of inconsistency in the things that he was talking about. There's a lot of inconsistency in what's going on under the ground also. So you have to understand what types of areas it's appropriate to work in, um, and then. You have to look for the, those people in the area who are capable and desirous of being well drillers. Okay? And it's usually, I mean, it can be people who are already involved in well digging, of which there are some. It can be people who are laborers. It can be community uh, people who are just uh, um, um, interested in, in finding a new way to make a living. And so you, you, you have to train local well drillers. Um, one interesting way to, to, to scale it is you have a team of three that are drilling a well. There's an older guy and two younger guys. And eventually, those younger guys are going to go off and train two other younger guys. And that's the, way, that's the way it happened in South Asia. I mean, nobody actually did it there, but it, over a period of 50, 60, 70 years. OK, I'm moving. Um, and then you have to create a business service model. In other words, 
how are these well drillers going to make a living? You have to help them to develop a business model that, that is profitable for them. How are they, how are they going to charge for their services? Who's going to pay for this? Who's going to pay for that? Are they going to get money up front? Are they going to give somebody credit? All of these things. Okay? And then, of course, you have to help with promotion. Okay? There has to be, you have to stimulate a demand. That means demonstrations, um, uh, farmer meetings, group meetings, etc. Okay, some quick principles. This is something that researchers quite often don't pay attention to. The investment cost that, I mean, we can come up with the greatest technology in the world, but if, there's no, but if, if, a, if farmers can't afford it, then it's, it goes nowhere, okay? So getting cost down, or, or, or if, we, if we get it down as low as we can, and then we have to look at financing options. And that's also very difficult. Um, uh, Rural-based financing is a, is a field that ID is involved in right now, but it's, it's, a, it's a new field. There's not, I mean, it's not new, but it hasn't been very successful in the past. So working with that is, is very critical. Um, private sector supply chains. Don't bypass private sector supply chains. It's, it's so much easier to just go buy a bunch of stuff and get it out to the farmers. That's the kiss of death for, for scale because it's just not, it's, it, it's, it's just going to flop after you stop pouring money in. And then last mile distribution is critical. So farmers, you need to bring things to the places where farmers shop. Every farmer shops. Every farmer goes to the, to, the, to the local market or to the local town, even the poorest of farmers, okay? And that's where you got to get the things that you want them to, to, um, to buy, okay? So that's where that retailer or developing retailers out to that last mile is important. And these, um, we shouldn't be afraid to put public funding into all of the, all of these pieces have to be public funded. Technologies that are good for smallholder farmers are quite often not profitable enough to support the R&D and the promotion and the monitoring and evaluation. And so that's, that's the role of, I think, the people in this room. Um, two minutes. So, so, so this is my question. Um, you know, everybody's talking about scale, and scale is great, and ID has been focused on scale from the very beginning. But what is the balance between between scale and depth of intervention, okay? So this is just a little, just maybe a topic for discussion. I mean, how much do we, by saying we have to reach a million of something, do we sacrifice reaching 200,000 at a much greater uh, intensity? And what, what, what are the, how do we make decisions about that? And, and I think, you know, and the other thing about scale is I can reach a million of something. But a million of something is, only means something based on the impact that I bring to it, right? And they, even that impact is only relevant if it's reaching the right people and if it's sustainable. Okay, so it's, it's very easy to pump numbers up. Um, but I think we have to be careful about what those numbers really mean. Thank you very much. to join us from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, hello, everybody from Nairobi. I hope you can all hear me. Am I? Okay, this is Steve New, and um, I'm waiting to see my presentation on the, on the screen right now. Can I get it? Great, okay. Okay, let me start again. Hi, everyone. I'm talking from Nairobi, and uh, it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be online with everybody. Um, I work with a company called Fintrack. In case you, there may be a few people out there who haven't actually heard of us. Um, we're, we are a, a consultancy, agribusiness consultancy contractor. Um, in the past, we've mainly focused on on high value crops. Uh, obviously, if if farmers have small areas of land uh, to make a, to make a decent living, they need to focus on something that has a relatively high value. So, some of the things that we we have specialist knowledge in uh, have involved research. Over the years, as we've worked on things like vanilla, passion fruit, uh, flowers, so these are things that have a very high uh, value per unit per, per square meter. Um, 
So I, I'm not sure how research oriented. This is a, just a, I'm going to I'm going to be able to be, but I'll try and relate everything I say to to, to specific research and technology uh, adaptations. And this is a, just a, a slide about FinTrax method, methodology. It's a generic slide, and as you can see, new technologies are very much part of, of what we do, along with good agricultural practices um, and uh, market opportunities. And I I think I'm going to be mentioning market opportunities a lot over the next few minutes. Okay, so what are the major constraints to, to farmers adapt, using technology? Well, the first thing is why would they want technology in the first place? And the only reason anyone is going to make any investment, any farmer like anyone else in, in, into any kind of technology is, is if they've got access to markets. And most uh, smallholders, most small-scale growers in Africa and elsewhere still have fairly limited access to markets. They live in remote areas. Um, they don't they don't themselves uh, do much consumer spending, so they, they have very little knowledge of markets. So that's the thing. Before we even think about you know why the technology doesn't get to the farmer, why is, has the farmer got any reason to buy it? Um, also, we, what we find is that that um, most companies, and we have to have companies involved here, obviously to supply the technology, but also to um, to buy the product for which the technology is needed, generally speaking, don't, don't have business models that allow them to buy for, for thousands of farmers economically. So again, we, we have to look at this bigger picture if we're, if we're looking at transferring research and technology. Um, then, of course, the farmers need knowledge and application of cost-effective technologies. They have to, they have, something has to be affordable. I think everyone's said that so far. It's pretty obvious that, that, that if, a, if a, a group of farmers are going to buy a pump, they want something that costs a few hundred dollars, not something that costs, costs thousands. Um, and then finally, under, underpinning all of this, unless there's, unless there's finance and credit available to purchase the, whatever it might be, the pump or, or the machinery, um, there has to be finance and credit. You know, most, most smallholders most farmers in Africa and, and elsewhere live, live hand to mouth. They don't really have um, many uh, they don't If they're going to spend their money, they need to see a fairly short term return on it. And this applies particularly, I, I think, to buying any kind of technology. Um, and how's the best way to get around this? Okay, so if we think that technology is a good thing, and I think it is, then then basically, how, really, most of the most of the ways that we've tr we've tried to raise productivity, which involves technology and, and, and better inputs, more precision use of inputs, um, is by working on business models where where, where where growers can come together to either to share share resources or to uh, to market to some extent collectively. Um, and this can be done um, in many ways, but I, but there's something that, that maybe the researchers don't always pay attention to, and that is that, and people sort of tends to be tend to be forgotten. There's a general view that somehow smallholders inherently are less productive than large scale growers. Actually, the opposite is true. Up to the farm gate, up until the the time that a product is sold by a small scale grower, actually they've got every opportunity to be more productive and get higher yields. The problem comes after that with aggregation of the product. This is pretty obvious, but we don't always think about it. So aggregation, once you get past the farm gate, the, 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 the smallholder becomes increasingly less competitive. But up to the farm gate, there's absolutely no reason why smallholders should not be fully competitive. The real problem for smallholders um, is not that they can't get high yields and produce competitively, it's that they're, they're, they're constrained by the size of their land, which is why we normally um, on income generating projects at least, we're focusing on the, the higher value products if we can. And usually those higher value products require some research and some technology. Um, the other thing about, yeah, so this is my second point really, the other thing about, about working in groups is that you reduce the cost of production in various ways. You have an opportunity to improve uh, quality control. It's a big thing if we're dealing in cash crops that these days quality uh, uniformity in particular, but also getting the highest possible quality is a big is a big deal. Um, and I, I already mentioned aggregation. Uh, also, less risk. And and when we talk about business models for smallholders um, that incorporate almost inevitably, if they're commercial, uh, various uh, improved seed and, and and good post harvest equipment and so forth, 
Um, actually, there's this perception that really it increases the risk, that buying for a lot of growers increases risk. Actually, I'll come to this later, but in Kenya, for example, we're, we're about probably more than 100,000 small-scale growers are supplying the top UK or European supermarkets. The reason that's so successful is because buying from smallholders means that the, the risk to the exporters is actually less than if they were growing vegetables on large irrigated farms. Um, the other thing about, about working in groups is that commercial groups is that it means that technology can be shared. So it obviously shares the cost, it shares the cost of training. People who are good at doing something can show other people all the obvious things. And, and then, of course, in the end, the marketing is easier. Um, bought buying of technology, of obvious. Um, but then, perhaps finally, again, and most important, um, it's much easier for banks and finance agencies to, 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 to provide funds for, uh, for anything, inputs or technologies, um, if they're doing it through some kind of um, uh, group scheme. So for all these reasons and many more, really I think the only way to, to commercialize farmers and therefore and, and to actually introduce technologies that make farmers even more commercial is if they're working together. And here's an example. I really, I put this example in because I was just talking with a company last week called Dryland Seed in Kenya. They have an interesting business model, and they they're trying to sell to grow and sell open pollinated, um, mainly legume and sorghum seed. This is not the highest quality, the highest value products. So, um, and generally, as you know, the, the the large seed companies aren't that interested in marketing open pollinated seeds. But nevertheless, farmers need improved quality, higher quality seed. Even so, what what, what Dry and Seed are trying to do is to is and are doing actually quite successfully at the moment is to um, is to contract uh, a few thousand or a few hundred smallholders to to grow and certify seed, mainly cowpea. Um, Pigeon pea, green gram, uh, sorghum, and so on. These are slightly higher value than maize, but but not much. Um, and they they they've gone through a process of inducing the right technology to the farmers. They've they've brought new varieties to the farmers, which uh, um, which can yield better and, and can be are more adaptable. And they've got technology for for grading and storing. Um, and they've got a strong market, but. You know, they, got, they came to my office and said, "Well, okay, we want to do. We want to, We've got a market for three or four times more uh, that we can that we can contract. Why? Because we can't get finance um, to do it. And I think I'm just, yeah. This is a typical story that whether you're selling technology or whether you're selling a product, um, generally speaking, finance is still the issue. Um, and. Yeah, I just I thought it might be. It's always interesting to look at examples of, of research and you know, in this case, research and technology. Without and, and so I I've, I've, I've sort of put up or oh, just mentioned three examples that we've been involved in over the last few years um, of where technology and, and research, a certain amount of informal and formal research, and then technology has contributed to a big a big success. Uh, the first one um, is is to do with vanilla uh, in Uganda. Um, Uganda is about, I think, the second biggest supplier of vanilla to the world market right now. Um, and a few years ago, a decade ago, um, was was not a producer at all. Um, and that has largely been possible because of a certain amount of research. In, uh, actually, research and then technology that was zero cost to the growers. Uh, the growers had to cooperate, but basically, when you when you um, mature it, when you grow vanilla. You need to process it on the farm or very close to the farm, which requires a certain amount of basic technology. Um, in this particular case, um, what we did was we got uh, coffee. Ex uh, Uganda is a coffee exporter. Coffee exporters knew nothing about vanilla, but we were able to sort of bring them the right kind of uh, low-cost technology they needed um, to put processing plants in rural areas, um, which could then be accessed by thousands of, of farmers. So you know, it didn't require much research. The reason it worked was because of the high value of vanilla at that time, which gave everybody a great return. They were investing money up front. The farmers got their um, got their got their credit. Um, the fresh vegetable industry in Kenya is massive. As I said it's it's sophisticated, but it's fed almost completely by by smallholders. Um, 
a lot of research and technology goes into this production. Um, mostly, though, is to do with with uh, agrochemical uh, agrochemicals um, and irrigation. So. But again, the reason this has been so successful, and say hundreds of thousands of farmers are benefiting and using technology, they adapt technology all the time, new, new seed varieties, um, more safer chemicals. So um, you know, what has happened over the past, past few years um, is because of demand from the market that uh, farmers have had to adapt uh, almost on a, on a, on a on monthly basis um, to, to, to using uh, insecticides and fungicides which are less persistent um, and uh, which are perceived to be safer for the environment. So, um, uh, but these are all the time farmers, uh, these are small scale farmers are innovating and using the fruits of research uh, because it's commercially viable for everybody. The, you know, the, the, the companies that sell the inputs, the smallholders themselves, the exporters, everybody's making money, so everybody's happy to adapt the, um, the te to, to adopt the technology. And finally, a very recent one that we're doing right now in, in Zimbabwe, um, which we, we're, where there's no cash flow whatsoever, nobody has any money in Zimbabwe, um, and good luck to them all tomorrow. I think it's there or this week when it's their election. But so we tried a, a model there whereby we we brought a, a plantation banana company onto an irrigation scheme where there's about 400 small scale farmers. Um, who basically pooled their resources um, to have a shared irrigation scheme of microjet irrigation. And uh, already now they're getting yields around 40 or 50, um, 50 tons per hectare, over 50 tons per hectare actually, um, using tissue culture bananas, which are relatively new uh, product of research in recent years. That everybody, that many smallholders I think around the world are, adop are adopting tissue culture banana planting for lots of reasons. Uh, and they get instant, they get money. You know, banana is a big market everywhere. Generally speaking, the margin for smallholders is high on bananas, and so we're taking advantage of that in Zimbabwe, producing very high yields. And there's a little picture here. You can see a tissue culture banana in the ground next to a a micro jet um, uh, sprayer. So again, these are not I don't I don't think revolutionary technologies or or, or particularly exciting research, but they work and they can be adapted in a very commercial uh, environment. Um, so I think my message is that, that we need research and we need technology. And smallholders can definitely ad adopt it quickly, but there has to be money in it for everybody. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Steve. We could hear you loud and clear. It was great to have you join us. Good. Um, so now we will move on to a Q&A portion. Uh, our speakers, would you like to move your chairs to the front, just uh, if you'd like to face the audience? Um, so we will alternate between the in-person audience and the online audience. Um, please remember to state your name and organization. And I would like to go ahead and um, give Suzanne Poland the chance to ask the first question. Thank you, Julie. Um, thanks, uh, Bob, Steve, and Jerry. That was very, very interesting. Um, I think as you went through all of these um, presentations, a lot of you talked about the challenges and constraints to scaling technologies. And the webinar entitled Scaling Technologies, Bringing Research to Farmers. Um, it's, it sounds like we're looking at, you know, sort of massive, um, multiplication of technologies or something, a kind of a top-down, when we say it that way, bringing research to farmers and markets. And uh, what it's really clear from what all of you said and, and what we really mean is uh, scaling up adoption of technologies, getting the research into use. And um, I think all of you talked at diff different ways about smallholder farmers and everything, but I would just like to ask if each of you could maybe comment and elaborate a little further on what you see as the role of the smallholder farmer in this um, agriculture innovation system uh, and how understanding the farmer's role could improve the designs for scaling up technologies. Maybe I'll go first since I had the first presentation. That's a that's a good question on the role of the 
a farmer in in this endeavor. Uh, to go back to that example that I showed from Malawi of this doubled up legume system, um, I think from the presentation you might have perceived that it was sort of top down. Here's some scientists coming up with a system, sort of uh, trying to get farmers to adopt it. But but actually, more to Suzanne's point and Bob's point about this this very um, uh, intensive interaction with farmers from the very beginning. This doubled up legume system that I illustrated is the result of about 15 years of work prior to Africa Rising in which a, a range of systems were trialed and, and tested on farm with farmers and many of those were eliminated. Maybe the labor requirements were too high Maybe the uh, outcomes were not enough to, to really interest farmers. Uh, the multiple benefits uh, just weren't there for these other systems. So the system that I showed is the result of this very intensive prior experience with farmers in determining what would be viable for their situation. So without that, you could be uh, chasing uh, all these different technologies or systems that, that really in, in, the, in the practical experience of farmers just simply aren't worth it. So uh, that's a long-winded way of saying get in there from the beginning with, with the farmers and, and really uh, let them illustrate their needs and, and test these. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think I, I talked in various parts of my presentation about that, but of course that, that very qualitative interaction with the farmers from the beginning. Um, maybe the, the, the part that's uh, important from, from our approach, when you take a commercial approach and when you're expecting farmers to buy things, and if you incorporate that from the beginning in terms of doing test marketing or prototyping with farmers, um, you're not distributing things. You're getting people to buy things. And therefore, that is a kind of substantive interaction with farmers because when someone makes a decision to invest money, they're making a de they, they have made that decision. Of course, before that, you have to find out what you have to have the substantive interaction to find out what it is that will make them purchase that. But that then going to that level then enforces the, that farmers are accepting this. Or if they're rejecting it, then you have to find out why. You have to survey them and find out. Um, and also, it's about price. Uh, farmers, you know, they vote with their pocketbook uh, quite often. Do you have any um, questions you'd like to add? I could, um, is this Steve? I'm, yeah. Okay, I'm not quite sure I, I understand the question exactly what the role is of smallholders, but I mean, like all farmers, I, I suppose their role is to, is to produce increasingly better products at lower prices for a consumer society. But I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't get to, we should sort of remember that these smallholder farmers aren't smallholders by choice. They're just people without much land or, and no water. So maybe, maybe you know, if we're looking at research directed, and none of them want to stay smallholders, and no agricultural economy wants to remain dependent on smallholders. So, you know, we, we, we need a mixture of, uh, and there is a, a the problem for most smallholders um, is their land their land size is just too small, certainly in East Africa, uh, to ever get a, a reasonable living. So in the end, there has to be some some change in this. But so we have to be careful when we look at doing research and technologies that, that, and to remember that it's really an interim situation. We hope. I also wanted to highlight that we have uh, 125 people joining from online from all over the world, um, including multiple African countries, England, Italy, Nepal, and Thailand. And we'll throw a question back to them right now. Yes, yeah, so there were a number of questions about collaboration. Uh, Nome Sakane from Harvest Choice IFPRI in DC asked that, um, notice that several players are currently involved in scaling up technologies. And since August 2012, Nome has been leading a project in Ghana um, with different players are highly competing in northern Ghana to work with the communities. Every player claims their own community, and they may have different interests, which could lead to conflicts. How do we ensure that all players are well organized to work together in a more complementary way? Um, 
And Liz Caselli asked a similar question, asking the panel to speak more about the structure of private sector partnerships in the target market. Who takes what role and who has long-term ownership of the technology? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the fir the, to, to respond to the first question, um, I think that um, the critical piece is, is not competing about different technologies. The critical piece is your, uh, let's say, your, your business model. <laughs> uh, you know, there, what the conflicts that we come into with people is somebody is in the field and they're giving something away or they're, or they're giving a three-quarter uh, subsidy. And we're coming in and trying to sell things. And that, so, so these things have to be worked out between, uh, between organizations. That can, I mean, you can't sell something if someone else is giving it away. And you can't build commercial systems if you're not selling something. Um, and in all the examples, whether, it, uh, uh, whether it's the, 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 the pigeon pea, or whether it's you know, uh, pumps, or whether it's micro sprinklers, or all these things, ultimately they have to be sold to farmers. Um, so I think, well, I don't have an answer to it, but I know I, we run into this all the time. And a lot of government programs that want to give things away. There's a lot of NGOs that, uh, that are more on a relief model, I would say, rather than a development model. And they're, they're, they're asking farmers what their needs are and giving it away. So this is the major kind of conflict that we come into in the field. Um, what was the second question? Uh, Public-private partnerships. Um, I'm in favor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what I don't know what the question was. But. Are there no other comments. I'll throw it open to. Yeah, can I can I make a comment? This is Steve. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, just to go back to to um, to the question of you know what what how should the private sector be involved? Well, I think the private sector, you know, we're in a, we're in a private sector society. The whole point of development is for for people to participate more uh, and, and become wealthier. And you know, in some ways, we should be talking about agriculture for wealth creation rather than food security all the time. But but what I would say is that that for things to for for good technologies to be scaled up quickly. You need, first of all, you, you need an end market. You've got, unless, unless they can be applied in, in a particular environment where farmers can use the technology um, really, you know, fairly quickly to, to, to generate uh, income quickly, they can't see a benefit. So there has to be a, a sort of triangular arrangement. You've got to have someone, you've got a product that you're going to grow and sell. Then there's an opportunity to scale up a technology. Um, I'm trying to think of a, um, a good example. I think a good example that, that, that is old hat now really is, is like something, an old, old technology which is evaporative cooling. So if you go around um, the, 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 the areas of Kenya uh, where farmers are growing vegetables to sell to the top supermarkets in Europe, these are guys with like a half an acre of land, for the, well, you know, a quarter of a hectare of land or less even. And they all have and some of them quite, uh, we've shown a lot of ingenuity, they've rigged up ways of creating small evaporative uh, coolers around their fields using charcoal or brushwood or, and, and water, uh, canvas, all kinds of stuff. And, they, and they've done it because if you plant French beans, uh, eight weeks later you're getting paid as much as about, uh, perhaps more, um, more than 60 cents a kilo for a crop that costs a fraction of that to grow. And you can do it three times a year. Their, their incentive to use, and of course these same farmers are also using, as soon as they're available, the best and safest uh, agrochemicals. But they, they have a big incentive to do this because they're involved with, with companies that, that are on their doorstep sort of time selling them these new technologies, these new products. And at the other end, they have got companies buying the product they're growing. So you really have to have that. If you have that, you're going to get scalability. Thank you, Steve. We'll take a question from in person. Sure. Hi, I'm Zachary Arney with ACDI Avoca. I had a quick question for Steve. You had mentioned that um, buyers who buy from 
smallholder farmers typically have fewer risks, and I wasn't quite sure mm -hmm. what risks you were referring to. Um, and if I could yeah, I, yeah, sure. Good. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, I'll be really quick. I, but the yeah, put it this way: if you're growing a high-value product like a uh, a fruit or a vegetable in particular, but it can apply to other things. Um, one of the worst things, for example, that can happen is you get a hailstorm. Um, and these are quite common all across the, uh, East Africa, at least I think in, in many places around the world in, in our sort of latitude. Um, and that wrecks your crop for two or three weeks or more because the, the skin is damaged. You have to basically you have to throw 90% away. If you've got 500 groups of farmers producing these vegetables in a, scattered across a, a wide area, the chances of all of them getting hit by um, by hailstones is are minimal. In fact, maybe uh, the you know you might get five or ten percent affected, but the rest is okay. You can still meet your supermarket order. If, on the other hand, you've got a hundred hectares of baby carrots or, or no, carrots don't count, but beans or peas or something in one plantation, then of course you're going to lose the whole crop. So in that sense, that the, the risk is mitigated, and this is this happens all the time. The other thing, of course is management of labor. It's much easier to, um, to have, I mean, people working for smallholders, the labor and the smallholders are, don't walk off the job if something goes wrong. So, and this is, so, I mean, there are many ways, but I only, I'm, and the reason I raise this is because people usually think the opposite. People talk about the risks associated um, with smallholder production. But actually, if you really look at it objectively and don't make that sort of cliche assumption, the fact is there are many advantages, also profitable advantages, um, of buying from large numbers of growers. You just have to adapt your business model. We'll take a question from online. This question comes from Jared Gonsal from MIT. The speakers highlighted the importance of the value chain, supply chain, and private sector, and we office, often focus on product and technology innovation. But can the speakers highlight some process and or business model innovations? Mm. <laughs> well, I, I, look, I think it depends what you call an innovation. So this is Steve again. Um, the ones that really work, I think, or where, you, where you've got, um, where, is, is where companies are able to um, to, yeah, to, 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 to focus on products um, where they can buy, where they can buy as well. I mean, coffee, I guess, is a big advantage. You know, the, the coffee companies often do buy it, and the coffee bro traders do buy from smallholders, um, and they've adapted their business model just for that. Um, but the, the, the best ones, I think, are where credit is also um, credit is also involved, whereby you have a triangular relationship. And again, I can, you know, since I'm here in Kenya, I, I got lots of examples in Kenya, but also it applies, I think, in other countries, um, whereby you know the, the the company has an interest in procuring products from, and this can be um, mango, it can be uh, French beans we've mentioned because they're big products. It can be uh, maybe coffee, but they um, or tea. Um, but in the process of procurement, they then, they, then, they then actually go into an arrangement with the bank so that the bank gets paid directly by, by the company. Um, and this isn't necessary if you're, if you're buying products from a plantation, from a, from a large-scale grower. But if you're buying from hundreds of growers or even thousands, then that kind of credit model is absolutely crucial. And there are quite a few of those around which are now, and they're, and they're increasing all the time. And I think because the banks have seen a long-term commercial advantage now in actually recruiting new new uh, new clients through this kind of arrangement. Everybody benefits: the banks, the you know the processors, the farmers themselves, and their children. Actually, so <clears throat> it's interesting that you uh, picked that model because, as I was thinking, I came up with a similar model. Something we were doing in northern Ghana, um, which involved small local banks. Uh, sellers of uh, irrigation technologies and farmers groups and the the business and and also installers so there is a the 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 bank is is loaning money to the group um, and the group goes to the uh, the the um, the retailer buys it with a kind of voucher and then the the retailer turns in the voucher to the bank and gets the money for that 
um, for that product. So that's a kind of uh, a, another triangular relationship, um, which it, which works quite well. Hi, I'm Peter Boone from Corona Corporation. I have a, a question for Bob. Uh, when uh, your project that you mentioned, working for the Gates Foundation, where you assessed uh, different uh, technologies that were best suitable for scale, and you, um, the electric pump was one of the ones, the uh, a diesel, I guess, uh, powered pump. Um, <clears throat> did you also look at um, mechanized like bicycle pumps? I've I've seen companies like uh, Netafim from Israel uh, on a pilot basis having uh, just you know simpler mechanized pumps that you know don't use as much uh, you know they don't use diesel they're lower cost probably not as productive per hour but um, <coughs> more sustainable and easier to repair. Have you looked at those kind of alternatives at all? Well. ID kind of made its name on those kind of pumps uh, back in the 80s and 90s. Um, so yes, of course, and it's still part of our product mix. But what's happened? What happens over time? Um, and it happened in South Asia. Um, you know, there were a million or two million treadle pumps sold in South Asia. But if you go out now, you will see there's there's a tremendous amount of very cheap. Uh, three and four horsepower diesel pumps out there and, and people selling water to their neighbors and so forth. So as the price of motorized pumps come down, and in Africa where the price of human powered pumps is not so cheap, they start to bump up against one another. And, and this, I think, we, we, is something that we've encountered in Africa where um, uh, the price is close enough so that um, the the choice a lot of farmers will choose a motorized option. Yeah, it definitely returns to labor. Of course, then you have issues of fuel. Um, we're working on some solar powered uh, options at this point, but that's still a little bit expensive. But actually, solar powered options by the second or third year are going to be profitable. Are going to are going to be competitive. But the investment cost is higher. And again, we come back to, and especially in Africa, I mean, everything's cheap in Asia, and everything's expensive in Africa. In Africa, finance, 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 and getting a good rural finance system is so critical. Um, and then once you get, if you have a system like that, it opens up all kinds of possibilities for you. Uh, a question from online? Yes, there's a lot of conversation about the issue of gender in these these technologies happening in the chat box right now. Um, and they are concerned that the gender component has not been clearly stated or analyzed in this presentation. Uh, Britta Hansen of USAID BFS specifically asks, the question is, technology for who? Women are often left out of the conversation and implementation of new technologies, especially in terms of labor saving versus increasing women's time use. Well, uh, can I answer? Sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Here's a quick one. Look, I think that most technologies favor, I mean, the most important technologies that we need right now, certainly in Africa, are labor saving technologies. Uh, and these are going to benefit women. You know, it's, there is a myth, of course, that somehow labor is cheap in Africa or labor is cheap in developing countries. Of course, it's not. It's not available. It's not that productive. Uh, nobody wants to go out and farm in the hot sun without some, without um, and weed in, in the sun or apply man difficult irrigation systems. So I think that that labour-saving technologies and new uh, and new technologies for, for, for that, that enable smaller farmers to um, to save on labour will benefit women relatively more than anybody else since they do most of the work. I was just going to add that, um, uh, of course, gender is a very important part of USAID's research efforts. And uh, you know, there are many examples across our research portfolio that, that indicate that. But just talking about that example that I provided with the doubled up legume system, that's particularly of interest to women because of the nutritional value and the labor savings. You're harvesting more crops with fewer planting um, uh, operations. The, the, the field preparation and planting is a major labor requirement and it's often done by women 
So to get more harvests um, with fewer plantings is a, is a big boon, uh, particu particularly for women. I think in the case of, of the pigeon pea, that might, the, 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 uh, the benefits to women in particular may be a constraint. I think this needs more analysis. May be a constraint to increasing the availability of pigeon pea seed more widely. In other words, uh, if it's not seen as as a as a top tier crop for commercial production, it may limit its availability, thus limit its um, uh, scalability. But we we're, we're we're looking more into that. Oh. We'll take a, an in-person question. Let's see, I know you've had your hand up for a while. So. Hi, uh, Tim C. Xiao from the uh, Office of Science Technology at USAID. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is actually for Steve. Uh, you mentioned about the, the lesser risk of buying uh, supply from a small um, farmer. Um, but I wonder, uh, because small farmer also uh, did not possess the scale of economy benefit compared to a uh, large scale farmer, do you imagine um, it will be more uh, the sort of the supermarket uh, channel uh, management managers will prefer actually mid sized farmer and um, harvesting from different locations to mitigate the risk of the natural disaster? Or uh, do you think they will uh, prefer to go to small farmers? Um, because I imagine. The number of small farmer will be uh, a lot more, and that's a much higher transaction cost for um, a larger company to deal with that many vendors. Uh, that's my first question regarding the risk and whether they'll prefer a mid-sized uh, farmer uh, in different locations or a small farmer. And the second question is for IDE, actually. Um, regarding uh, the water management, because um, most of the activities that I've heard from this presentation uh, are about Increasing the expose uh, about increasing the exposure of water to a larger surface, and also to drag water from um, uh, from underneath the ground to the surface. And and I imagine that in Africa, with uh, in many places with higher evaporation rate, um, are we actually um, eating on the reserve for the water in Africa? Because those kind of issues have uh, been observed in other parts of the country, where when they tap into the underground water, actually it, it damaged the, the uh, geological structure of the land for the long term. And imagine as the motorized pump gets cheaper, and the water usage demand will go higher. And I wonder, uh, is there any other uh, complementary technology that will help to preserve the water while uh, uh, boosting the uh, productivity of the farmers? Thank you. Thanks. Um, sh shall I answer first? I think that was the first question. Yeah, I think when it comes to who, what, what would the, who would the supermarkets rather buy from, um, I don't think they care really, as long as they're getting a product which is um, as cheap as as cheap as it can be, uh, and the quality is reliable. So it comes down to traceability. As far as the as the pr production is concerned, yeah. Th I, look, there are various reasons why small scale growers, certainly in horticulture, have. Uh, are just can be or ought to be just as productive. The real, the two disadvantage uh, disadvantages for, for small scale growers are basically um, the cost of the cost of consolidation aggregation. You know, I think that's what you're calling a transaction cost, uh, and also quality variability and traceability. Actually, we've got some great technology coming out now that where we can uh, trace product all the way back to the even a, a, a small grower. Uh, r relatively cheaply. Again, this coming out from private sector companies, companies who've got a long-term sort of strategic interest in being in the business. So, so even companies that are uh, using IT and in their sort of day-to-day -day business are starting to develop these uh, these uh, great IT systems for tracing traceability of smallholder farmers. Um, I think that yeah. I, I, but as far as the supermarkets, I guess if the supermarkets have any preference at all from a market end. Then they would like to project themselves as, you know, socially responsible um, uh, organisations that don't stock their shelves, you know, with food full of preservatives and that kind of stuff. They buy from poor African farmers. So they probably would marginally prefer that. And let me just also add to that before I answer the other question. Um, 
that's why the and I, he's sort of alluding to this, but the critical thing is aggregation. If you can get farmers to aggregate their produce, then you, it, it can be the same transaction cost buying from a hundred farmers as it is buying from five farmers, if you if they're aggregating. Um, to answer your other question, this it's kind of a two-part question. One is about uh, you know the the sustainability of extracting water. Um, of course, it, it varies from place to place. But in, in this research project, they did quite a, an extensive study of the, of the renewable um, uh, water resource all over Africa. And they came out with quite high numbers of, uh, of, of potential, potentially renewable extraction of water. And quite often, you really have to break it down between shallow water and deep water. So the places where we've really gotten into trouble, like in Western India, they're extracting deep water, which is like water mining, okay? And that water is, all, is probably 10,000 years old, okay? And then once you extract it, it doesn't get re replenished very easily. But shallow water, where you have a reasonable monsoon climate, is, is renewed every year. Um, so you're basically, you're, you're drawing down a, a shallow aquifer that is renewed during the, during the monsoon season. If you take northern Ghana, uh, which if you go there now, or, or if you went there a month ago, it would look like a desert. But they get about 800 millimeters of rain in three months, which is a tremendous amount of rain. It's as much as you have in Washington, I think, you know, um, or, or <laughs> maybe a little bit west of here. Um, uh, the other thing is about technologies that can help you reduce the use of water. And uh, ID has been quite involved in introducing low-cost uh, drip irrigation systems and sprinkler systems, micro-sprinkler systems, as, as uh, FinTrack talked about. And that, that reduces the amount of water. The problem there is the cost. And also, you know, in, in places where water is quite cheap to extract, farmers don't have quite the incentive to, to save water. Um, but uh, especially like in our Burkina Faso program, uh, our drip irrigation um, is quite uh, moving along there. So th those are the answers to your question. Uh, we have time for one last online question. Uh, yes, there's a lot of them that we didn't get to. But this one comes from Vincent Johnson at Biodiversity International in Montpellier, France. Um, the question is, Bob highlighted the need for funding support for M&E and post-project promotion, but many donors don't provide the longer-term funding necessary for this. How can we access support for longer-term work? Maybe that's a question for you guys. <laughs> yeah, uh, Suzanne Poland just uh, offered up uh, the suggestion to align funding streams so that we're combining uh, efforts on the technology side with other uh, goals and particularly aligning them with national government priorities so that it's not just the development community but there's that uh, element of program sustainability from the support side of the governments. I, uh, I wanted to pass the microphone over to Rob Bertram for some very quick closing comments. Um, but right before I do that, ask if you wouldn't mind filling out the surveys that are on your chairs or in the chat box online. Those will help us um, this August help review our processes and improve things for n next year. So Rob? Thank you very much, Julie. And good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to see a uh, standing room only. And I guess if we had rafters, people would be hanging from the <laughs> rafters. Um, I want to start by thanking the newest team in the Agricultural Research and Policy Office. That's the Scaling Technology Team. It's headed by Andy Levin. And special thanks for today's program to Elizabeth Skugar, who I think worked with all of the speakers to put together what's been a tremendous program. And the discussion that it's prompted, I think, has shown how it resonated. Um, I want to just make a few comments, um, starting with Jerry and his discussion. I think one of the messages, Jerry, that was inherent in your comments is this issue of biomass. And, 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 and it's, it cuts across our interest, whether we're interested in biodiversity, climate change, uh, sustainable intensification of agriculture. And uh, the, one of the other examples I think that didn't come up that the biomass is very related to is the integration of livestock. And there's another farmer in Malawi that we've talked about before named Rhoda 
who has used the fertilizer trees, the nitrogen fixing trees, to greatly increase the productivity of her land, which had been very degraded. And also, she's now, I don't know how many pigs she has now, but a lot more than she used to. And she's built a house. And uh, I mean, it's, they're really great stories. So the livestock piece of this is another thing. And then together with the legumes that Jerry discussed and the livestock, I think, brings us back to the nutrition piece. And we have some uh, initial data coming out of that work in Malawi that Sig Snap at Michigan State University has been involved in that shows that we're starting to see improvements in child nutrition in the households that are adopting these doubled up legume systems. So some of that's an income effect, no doubt, but some of it may be a food effect and, and, and in terms of direct consumption. So we're going to be studying that more, but um, it, it, it's, it's an exciting time. And, and, and thank you, Jerry, for those great comments. Uh, Bob, I think you really did us all a treat by talking about uh, water. This is, uh, I think, a big piece of what is a much larger problem in African agriculture, and that is undercapitalization. And how do we get capitalization uh, into the system? Uh, I know it came up towards the end of the discussion uh, about hydrology, but I was glad you mentioned that also because we've had some recent studies out of the UK and elsewhere that suggest that Africa has a very substantial potential to uh, use groundwater sustainably. Um, speaking about uh, motorized pumps, I was in uh, Nigeria just last week, and there's a Chinese pump that's being used there by and, and promoted by one of our USAID partners that attaches to a small motorcycle. So if you can imagine a service provider who has a motorcycle who can go to his client farmers, many of them women, who can pump surface water or even in some cases maybe hand dug wells because it'll pump 12 meters, uses a lot less uh, fuel than a regular diesel pump. So not that there's anything wrong with diesel pumps, but it's a step you know, in the right direction. And uh, that we can, we can envision that service provider providing uh, smallholder farmers, as I said, many women of the women who can then have a part of their land in year-round horticultural production, for example, where there's going to be both income impacts and nutrition impacts. Um, just uh, more broadly on, on that, I think that's part of a larger discussion on mechanization. And I think uh, on the water side, uh, this is an area that we are taking steps now. We're soon, Sahara Moon's team is going to soon be announcing a new uh, small scale irrigation program for Sub Saharan Africa. Uh, but I think the next thing on our agenda will be uh, mechanization as we go forward, thinking about how to uh, help smallholder farmers make this transition. Um, on Steve, I think, did us a great service by talking about the whole issue of finance and the private sector linkages, as did Bob. But uh, we're seeing some innovative approaches used by our missions where they're basically using outgrower schemes in staple crops to try to provide the inputs and the marketing opportunities, the aggregation that you mentioned, Bob. Um, uh, also, Steve, you mentioned the, the interest in the legumes, which are higher value and, of course, higher nutrition. Great opportunity for the research community to bring in new technologies. The tissue culture banana, another, the reason they're so good is because they don't, they're not filled with viruses. It's clean material, so that gives you a big boost in your productivity. So again, the, the building these linkages where farmers come to think of and all the partners think of where can we get the best technology that's going to give us the productive uh, outputs that we're looking for. Um, finally, or almost finally, uh, a couple of really good issues came out, uh, depth versus breadth, um, the impact uh, and the targeting, and the impact metrics. I think we're going to be wrestling with those. How does What does scalability mean versus our traditional value chain approaches? Are we trying in some of this scalability to actually let go of things so that they ripple out? And how do we then measure that? So we're going to be working with people like Ann Swindale and others in the SPPM, our, our, our program office in the Bureau for Food Security, and with our M&E leads and our missions to, to really think through how do we, what's the best way to look at this? Is it by measuring the number of adopters? Is it by measuring the number, the area of land that's being covered? Or do we need deeper information as we often do have in our value chain projects? Um, 
also then Steve raised the issue of smallholders. Um, that's a really challenging one, and there were some comments in the discussion about this. You know, we in the Bureau for Food Security have taken a smallholder approach, and we know that large holders and medium holders are out there, but if we're going to achieve our poverty reduction and our nutrition impacts, it's very hard to see how that can happen absent a smallholder approach. And I also want to remind people that um, smallholders are still very active in Asia, in areas where people, where smallholder farmers are no longer poor. There's still a lot of smallholders. So, you know, we're going to, Africa is going to be its own case, but there's a lot of South-South learning. You talked about the water. That's a great example of South-South learning, but I think we can learn through this transition that we're all seeking, where people are, go from poverty and undernutrition to a much better life. And, and can we do that in a smallholder way? The issue of finance, critical. We're going to do our best to, to put all this together and, and, and make that happen. So in sum, um, a lot of what we're doing in our R&D programs is about risk reduction to try to in, uh, uh, potentiate this transition for smallholders. And I think part of that is that it's risk reduction in staples that's going to help us diversify. In other words, people in Malawi are not going to stop growing maize unless they're sure they can either grow enough maize or buy enough maize to, in order to shift to higher value crops. So this, we're not looking at either or, it's both. It's, it's, it's legumes, it's livestock, it's horticulture, it's also maize, wheat, rice, sorghum, and, and the others. Um, water is uh, a huge thing for us. I mentioned we'll soon have a, a new program. We have Dr. Binyam Mayub, who's just joined our staff to lead those, that effort. Uh, mechanization, I said, we'll have a new push there. And then finally, I think the other take-home message from all of this is that we need to figure out how to link our partners, CGIAR, the innovation labs in the U.S. universities, our private sector partners in R&D, with the missions and their partners that are doing the value chains. And we need to not think of a dichotomy between value chains and technology because technology to work has got to be in a value context. So working with our mission partners and, and their partners, as we just did, uh, Sahara Moon uh, was at, uh, her group convened a meeting in Ghana just last week between these kinds of partners, and there's great potential there. So it's, uh, we're very excited about this, and thanks to all the speakers and to all of you who participated for making this such a rich discussion.